Well, good evening and welcome to Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Now, usually I say it's a great privilege every week to join with you to hear a story. This week it's not. This is just a pain this week to be with this particular guy. No, I am <laughs> kidding because the guy that I'm having as a guest tonight is a familiar person to those of you who've watched EWTM for a long time. He's a great friend, and the biggest problem is it takes so long for us to get together because we live halfway across the world. Our guest tonight is Jeff Cavins. He's a revert and former non-denominational minister. Um, Jeff, it is so good to it's see good you. It's good to see you, Marcus. Friend. Good to see you. Oh, A true friend. That's right. I mean, if we could just talk now, we'll turn the cameras off. I'd love to just catch up. Keep so them going. Things. Well, we're fine. <laughs> <laughs> But it is good to, to have you here, uh, and not only do I want you to update all the audience on the things that have been happening in your life, but I want to hear it too. But you know, especially how the journey has mm -hmm. continued for you in terms of your walk with Christ and His church. Sure. So since you're a returning guest, what I'd like to do is uh, back off and, and give us a reminder, even though for the audience, of course, Jeff's story is available on EWTN, our previous Journey Home program, as well as the chnetwork.org. But let's let's hear that journey again. Sure. Well, it's a, you know, I, I like to say that I was raised as an average American Catholic, you know, in the 1950s, 60s, 70s. And by the time that I was in high school, I really was searching for God. I was reading the Bhagavad Gita, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, and, <laughs> you know, Eastern meditation, and the Dylan and the Beatles and everything. And um, and I was really really searching, and I remember. Uh, but I hate to say, I drew up, but what amazes me, your book is you're so much about the scriptures now. Yeah. And it amazes me that you, why in the world you would turn from this to that stuff. Well, you know, I didn't know about unless that. you didn't have this stuff. I didn't know about that. Yeah. As yeah. an yeah. average yeah. American Catholic boy in the '60s and '70s, nobody told me to read that, and and I, you know, I, I, nobody ever brought it up to me. So I was reading things that were available and popular, you know, at the time. But the whole thing changed for me in my first year of, of uh, college and when I met a young lady who's now my wife, Emily. We've been married 41 years. Oh, oh. And uh, she introduced me to the Bible. Wow. And her mother, Alice, uh, the very first time I went over there, sat me down at the kitchen table, opened up an old blue Schofield Bible, and <laughs> began to talk to me about God loved me and had a plan for my life. And, and Marcus, from that day, I was hooked. And I, I don't know what it was, but I couldn't get enough of the Bible. And I started reading the Bible and reading and reading, and it ended up uh, taking me down to Dallas, Texas, and I went to Bible college. And it was uh, after that that I went to broadcasting school. Did you go to Dallas Theological Center? No, I went oh, to Christ okay. for the Nations Institute, oh, okay. gotcha. non-denominational school, yep. all Bible, 24-7. <laughs> and after that, I went to broadcasting school, and I ended up in, in radio. And it was there in North Dakota that I ended up leaving the Catholic Church in grand fashion at, a, at an open service, not a mass. Bishop Driscoll from Fargo came over to answer questions, and I was frustrated, to be honest with you. I was frustrated with the church. I was frustrated with my parents, frustrated with my family. I wanted more of Jesus. I read the Bible every day. I witnessed to people. I loved fellowship and so forth. But I didn't see it at that time, yeah. and I. Ended when up, was that? About a year. Approximately. That was uh, like 1980. 1980. Yeah, okay. 1980. Right. And I yelled publicly at Bishop Driscoll, and I told him as I stood up, because I, he he called on me, and and uh, you could raise your hand and ask questions. Full packed house, St. Catharines in Valley City, mm -hmm. and I raised my hand and I stood up and he said, "Yes, young man," and and I told him I was frustrated. And I didn't think there was a place for me in the Catholic Church. And I rattled off some arguments. And finally, I kind of, to be honest with you, I, I lost it. And I yelled at the top of my voice, I have had it with the Catholic Church. <laughs> and from this day forward, I'm no longer Catholic. And I walked out. And he started clapping. And I turned around and he said, I want to talk to you later. And I said, I don't know. And I didn't sleep that night. But the next night, I went out to the convent outside of Valley City, which I did every day. And the nuns told Bishop Driscoll, don't go back to Fargo. Stay here. He comes out every day. And I, I showed up the next day. And he was there. And we had a talk. And he said three things to me. He said, number one, he said, the journey you're on is of God. Number two, I'm going to call you Little Newman which I had no idea what that meant. I thought it was Al Newman from Mad Magazine. And the third thing he said, Marcus, was he said, he pointed at me, he said, mark my words, 
one day you're going to return. And when you do, you're going to teach your people. Hmm. And I said, I don't think so. And I got up and shook his hand. And <laughs> that's how I left the Catholic Church. And I, from there on out, I started turning to independent charismatic you know, churches and uh, went back to school, was ordained. And I was a pastor for 12 years, <laughs> two, two churches. And I'm assuming that your wife was very much involved with that whole journey and sense of excited about your commitment to Christ and pastoral ministry and... No, <laughs> she was not. <laughs> she was not. In fact, it troubled her because our whole life was geared around, in fact, we got married to serve Christ together. And I was in ministry for 15 years in radio Christian radio, I was a pastor for 12 years, an associate yeah. for three, and that was her life. Yeah. And now suddenly I'm saying, I'm going to be Catholic. Well, yeah, yeah, I wasn't jumping ahead to that yet, but I mean, she was loving you being a pastor, a Protestant pastor. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 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 she, yeah, we had a great so You guys great were life. great. Yeah. So what was it that sparked you to come back? Well, what, what, I think what sparked me to come back was I, I was a little bit different than some of my charismatic pastor uh, fellows my friends, in that I really did a lot of studying. Uh, I studied the church fathers. Uh, I studied Hebrew. Um, I studied the Jewish backgrounds to the faith. Went to Israel a lot. Studied with some of the top scholars at Hebrew University. And everything I was studying about the early church, uh, frankly, it didn't look like my independent charismatic church, as good as it was. Um, it, it looked very different. And so it, it, it began a quest for me to find that church. Is it still there? And uh, all of the major issues that I found as common denominators, the topics, uh, like uh, the Word of God being Scripture and tradition, uh, Mary the mother uh, of the church, um, the papacy, the Eucharist, these, these major, major teachings, uh, as I studied, I, I found that these were present in the current Catholic Church. And that brought on a crisis. I had to make a decision whether I'm going to continue on with this pastoring yeah. a church that didn't look really anything like that early church, or was I going to go back to the church that I left? And, um, and that was a lonely time. And yeah. thanks to uh, Bishop Paul Dudley uh, right. and his uh, guidance, Bishop Carlson, uh, and you, you played a role. Uh, in my coming back to the church. I, they got you going forward. I kind of set you back a bit, but they, <laughs> they were strong enough to pull you forward. Well, I called you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, I called you, and you, you probably don't remember the conversation. You meet so many people, but but you told me, you said, you, you need to talk to your childhood pastor. And I said, well, he's a bishop now in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, Bishop Dudley. And you yeah. said, Bishop Dudley, he's amazing. You got to talk to him. Yeah. And so when I did, I went there. Uh, that was where everything changed for me, and I made the decision uh, to come back to the to the Catholic Church and then resigned in my pastorate in, in Dayton, Ohio, and ended up at uh, Franciscan University, where you and I sure. uh, continued our friendship 25 years ago. Right, that's right. Was your uh, I forget whether your wife was right on step by step with you in that journey. You said the a year behind year, me, about a year. A year behind me. She went through RCIA at, at Franciscan University, and. Um, she came into the church with our daughter, our, young, our first daughter, Carly, uh, a year after I did. Yeah. As with so many who come into the church, especially former clergy, some people think that the Bible discourages people from becoming Catholic. In fact, there are some Catholics that discourage Catholics from reading the Bible because they think by reading the Bible they'll become Protestant. Mm -hmm. Were there any particular scriptures that were important for you, that awakened you to come home to the church? Well, a lot of them. You know, I mean, when I, when I was a Protestant pastor, the scripture was the center of our life. It was the center of our fellowship, the center of our services, our prayer life. Uh, it was, we had well-worn Bibles because that's where we lived and that's where we conversed with the Lord and we, we received direction and correction and encouragement from the Lord. When I came back to the Catholic Church, it was amplified because I had the catechism and I had some basic guidelines on how to even get more mm -hmm. out of the Bible. But there was one verse that always stumped me as a Protestant pastor, and that was when Paul wrote to the Colossians in chapter 1, and he said in verse 24, I rejoice in my suffering for your sake, and I fill up in my body that which is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. And when I read that, I, I couldn't make 
sense out of it. And one of the reasons was that I was partially subscribing to a kind of a faith and wealth gospel uh, with yeah. Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Copeland, and so forth, where you can have what you say in Mark eleven twenty three and 24, say into that mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea. And the problem was is that uh, that teaching, it wasn't, it wasn't working in my life, and this area of suffering was an enigma. It was, it was, it was foreign to me. Is how could this possibly be a positive? If Jesus came to die for me, what father would want his kids to suffer and call it an opportunity? And once I, I really understood the concept of suffering in the Catholic Church, and that is that we are actually working with Christ in his ministry, and we are doing the things that the Messiah did, that it, it really, really made sense. And that, that really changed my life, that the particular verse. I have in front of me a Bible that I'm not used to looking at, so <laughs> I can't find anything uh, as quickly. And I'll tell the audience a little bit more about why I have a different Bible in front of me, especially those of you. I've always had people that watch the program, if they notice something different, they I used to get an email saying, where's the, the book's in the wrong place. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but even in Romans, he talks about the necessity of suffering. Yeah. Right. Provided you suffer. Yeah. You know, that's in, in uh, 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 I think it's like Romans 8, but, or maybe it's even in Philippians. But the, the, this, this, all this can happen. He's Abba, Father, all these things are inheritance. Provided you suffer. Right. Provided you suffer. Right. And I didn't see that as a Protestant. And I don't know if I'd know what to do with it. Right. Well, my biggest misunderstanding prior to coming into the Catholic Church was the role of the body of Christ. And that I, I took the position that Jesus, he paid the price. He's the intercessor. He is the king. He's the shepherd. He's the physician. He's the he All of that. And he is. And my role is simply to receive the benefits as a child of God. But when you really read the New Testament, honestly, you'll see that Everything that Jesus did as the Messiah and the great shepherd, he shares with us. And so he is the intercessor between God and man, the man Christ mm -hmm. Jesus. But yet he shares that intercessory role with us, and especially the Blessed Mother. Uh, he is the healer, but he shares that healing ministry with the priesthood, you know, the, the, the sacrament of healing. Uh, he is the shepherd, but he gives us shepherds. He is the one who suffered for the sins of the world, yet he shares this suffering with us. And as St. John Paul II said, for this reason, that yes, there's nothing he didn't pay for, but that you might come to know his love, he shares the suffering with us. In other words, you can suffer, offer it up, and you can taste what real love is as you offer this up for other people. So that, that really helped me a lot, uh, the Catholic Church. It was the lens that I needed to see 2020 through. Yeah, um, when we cry, Abba, Father, it is the Spirit himself bearing witness that our, with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, mm -hmm. provided we suffer yeah. with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Yep. You know, another thing that brought me into the church, and, I, and I'll lay this out and then have your reflection on it, is the issue of salvation. What is necessary? What is important? To believe, to not believe, to do, to not do. And I remember standing in front of my congregation and realizing that those people out there trusted me, mm -hmm. that I'd done my homework. Right. And so if, if I'm telling them, this is what you must do to be saved, they trusted me. Mm -hmm. Now, you and I both know that Protestants already themselves probably got a pretty good idea what they, because of their own traditions, but still, I'm their pastor. And then I began seeing scriptures that I didn't know how to answer for that. Mm -hmm. Like Matthew, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Matthew 7, about not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the, and I'm a Calvinist, and is going to enter the kingdom of God. Um, Romans 2, about we will be held accountable for everything we do, and that's again in Revelation. And you can make a long list of these issues, and I realized, well, I had a quick knee-jerk answer to that. But wait a second. The eternal security life of these people is dependent on my knee-jerk answer to a thing? What is my authority? Right. 
to explain those scriptures away. Did you go through that same thing, my friend? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I agonized over it on Saturday nights. On Saturday nights, I used to tell my wife it was the loneliest time for me <laughs> because I was preparing my sermon. And I knew that what I was preparing had great ramifications. They were depending on this, their life, yeah. not only here on earth, but their eternal life. And I remember after I came back into the Catholic Church saying to Bishop Dudley, I said, I am tired of carrying the weight of the papacy on my shoulders, that I am not that, I'm not the answer to everything. And I needed to look to the church and to see what the church had to say, particularly about salvation. And as I dug into that, I, I realized that, that salvation is not just a matter of a proclamation, but it is my whole life of obedience that I believe, but I follow that up with action. I do. You know, if you're, you're, you're a friend of Jesus, you do what he says to do. And, you know, the, the Hebrew word for that, emunah, faith, has this idea of, of really two things. And the Catholic Church teaches this. Intellectual assent, I do believe this. Yep. I believe this. But then the second part of what, what Pope Benedict called, uh, the, you know, the teaching on amen was that there's two parts to amen or I believe. One is intellectual assent. I got it. I believe that book. I believe that verse. The second was a personal entrusting of yourself to that. So there really isn't a biblical idea of I just I just intellectually agree with you, but I have personally entrusted myself my whole life. It's like my wife saying to me, I trust you. I believe in you. Yeah. I, I don't just believe we're married, I believe in you. And that's that's that was what helped me coming into the Catholic Church is that is that this was it all in now. Not just what I believe, but everything in my life backing that up that I trust you, Jesus. Our guest is Jeff Cavins, of course, former host of the Life on the Rock program on EWTN. When, when Abraham's faith um, was accredited him as righteousness. justification, his righteousness, he couldn't stay in Ur. He had faith, but he had to leave Ur. Yeah. So there was faith and belief and then action. Yeah. It has to be his whole life. He had to leave it all behind. Mm -hmm. That's what you're talking about. Exactly. And I left her. <laughs> I left her and I had to follow. And I have to follow all the way to the end. You know, and I want to be faithful all the way uh, to the end. You know, if, uh, speaking of this, Marcus, I mean, faithfulness is like salt in a recipe. It's in every recipe in the Catholic Church. It's in everything. It, it is, yeah. Faithfulness is the key. You believe? Yay. But do it, you know, and it even says in the scripture, well, the devil even believes, uh, but he trembles. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's like when, I don't know if you did, but when I was a, a non-Catholic Protestant and sadly just ignorant, I would look scoffingly at uh, Catholic uh, crucifixes mm -hmm. and say, so they don't believe in the resurrection. Well, the truth is if we didn't believe in the resurrection, there'd be no crucifix. Right. You know, right. behind that, the salt, behind everything you see in the Catholic Church, uh, you know, a, an image of Our Lady, behind that is mm -hmm. the, the salt of the belief of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. You know, otherwise that stuff wouldn't even be there. So you came into the church and uh, of course you had nothing to do, so you began selling <laughs> shoes, is that what you did? Or what? <laughs> I thought I was going to. You know, when I came back into the, into the Catholic Church, it, it was at a time where um, EWTN had a major role in my life. Yeah. Uh, I owe a lot to Mother Angelica. She she changed my life. She really did. God used her to redirect my interest in broadcasting in the Bible and pastoring in a in such a beautiful way. But I was prepared to work at Seven Eleven, whatever I need to do, right. and, and and receive the Eucharist. But the Lord had other plans that I I could not have scripted this, and you could not have scripted no, it. Never. But in the Lord's providence, I landed at EWTN and. Um, and it was uh, for six years, right. and I loved it. It was a great opportunity for me. And prior to that, it was uh, Franciscan University. I have been very fortunate, yeah. Yeah. very fortunate and blessed in what the Lord has given me and, and led my wife and I down a certain path of creating Bible studies and, and uh, encouraging people to become um, modern-day disciples of the Lord. And I'm, I'm indebted. You know, I... I am too. I could say amen to everything you said because um, 
you know, I had no ambition to be on television or radio. I didn't have any skills or background. And, and I had a face for radio, though, and that was the <laughs> advantage. But, you know, Mother Angelica's uh, serendipitous invitation, and the only reason I mention that is that sometimes I feel like uh, converts like you or myself or Scott Hahn and uh, Curtis Martin and others, we kind of, in a way, we can be an, an optimistic example to others who are considering making the same junk, but in reality is, we aren't the norm. No, we aren't the norm for most clergy converts that come into the church, and that's a real struggle. It is, it is, and uh, and it's a, it's an ache in my heart to to meet with with Protestant pastors who, uh, on paper, are in love with the church, and they want this to become an experience where they can fully commune with Christ in the Eucharist. They can be part of this this family, and. Um, one of the things that we can pray about, Marcus, and I've noticed, and I'm sure you have, yeah. is that we need to create opportunities for these people who are blessed, and, and they do want to come in. But this is all they've known, is being a leader and a teacher and a, and a catechist, in a sense. And, um, and my heart goes out to them, and I would love to see a movement in the church to help these Protestant ministers come in. Yeah. Um, they're the ones that want the fullness. Well, there is a movement. It's called the Coming Home Network International. I've heard of it. <laughs> I've heard of it. You, you know what? You've done more. I tell you what, you played a role in my life. And every person that I teach today, you've got a part of that. And I know that you have helped thousands of, of people. And, and God bless you for that. Well, I appreciate that. But what I was more joking at, we, we do have the Coming Home Network. But my point is, um, many of them come in and their gifts aren't used. Right. So what we need in terms of a program or an encouragement is, is ways of encouraging the hierarchy mm -hmm. to recognize the gifts of these men and women. And I think you and I are, are really interesting examples in this sense. Neither of us were academic scholars. Mm -hmm. We were small church pastors. Mm -hmm. That's what we were. Mm -hmm. By the mercy of God, God took, at least I was a salzier. I don't know about you, but he's done some nice things for the kingdom through me. Praise God. It's, it's his grace. Mm -hmm. We want to say bishops, we're just regular guys mm -hmm. that love Jesus Christ, that God opened our hearts to ministry years ago, and then we've come into the church bringing some stuff with us, mm -hmm. and then by God's grace, we've been able to use that right. for the kingdom. But, there's, there's but, for, but for every one of you and me, there's, there's 5,000 of these people out there right. that, that want to be used and they want to be a part of the family. And let's face it, they're just human. They want to be affirmed in their, their gift yeah. and in their, their leading. God is leading them into the fullness of, of faith. And uh, I, I pray for them all the time. Often when my staff and I talk to non-Catholic clergy who are leaning towards the church, sometimes just saying right away, well, how do we become a priest? And, and uh, our answer is, there's a, there's a parable in Luke, and, and I'm wondering if, if this parable uh, rings with you, about the wedding feast. And Jesus' advice is, when you come to the wedding feast, don't take the front row seat. Mm -hmm. Because someone might come along and say, hey, you're not supposed to be there. He said, take the back row. And then wait until you're invited forward. Right. And to me, that's the advice of anyone coming into the church. Absolutely, absolutely, is be faithful, uh, look for open doors, and um, and seek you know seek an opportunity if you can. But you're right; is that the Lord will promote you. The Lord will will make that that opportunity available to you. And that's what He did with me, is that I didn't see any of this coming. I really didn't, <laughs> and uh, um, I could not have orchestrated any of it. I'm not that good. <laughs> Um, there's a bunch I want to talk to you after the break, but um, there's a scripture that I mentioned probably more than any scripture on the Journey Home program, and it's from the beginning of 2 Corinthians that talks about the fact, oh, and I know you've written a book on this, we're comforted that we might comfort. We're comforted that we might comfort. Yeah. And I often think about that the way he prepared you, like your bishop was telling you, you're going to go away and you're going to come back because God's preparing you. Mm -hmm. Has that been true in your life? Absolutely. It has been, uh, you know, when I left the Catholic Church, I left as an angry young man. I returned as a, uh, I'd say, more humble, broken uh, individual that 
realized my need. I guess you could say humility, in that I realized who I was in light of, in in, in, in the, uh, who I am with God and who I am with you and my brothers and sisters. And he, he brought back with me many of the good things that I learned when I was a Protestant. My love for scripture, my love for witnessing to people and telling them about Jesus Christ, um, my opening my home up to fellowship, uh, intercession, mission trips, all of these things I really didn't learn as a Catholic. I learned as a, as a Protestant, but when I brought them back, I realized they are Catholic, yeah. but we're not seeing a lot of examples you know, of that among yeah. the laity. And so I, uh, I had an interesting thing. Maybe we can talk about this on the other side of the break, but it was when I came back to the Catholic Church, how much of my, the riches I let go of only to realize later, yeah. no, I got to return to this, this beautiful relationship with the Lord and learning how to share Christ with, with other people. I kind of left that for a while. When I found Christ back in college, the pastor that brought me to Christ by grace gave me a, a life verse. I yes, don't know if you had a life I do. verse. Okay. I do. Well, I'm wondering if my life verse also makes sense in your life. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He'll direct your paths. That's great. I mean, is that... Yeah. Oh. Describe your own journey of Christ. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Because my, leaning on my own understanding was not getting me anywhere, and I, I realized that uh, life is bigger than me, uh, the future is bigger than me, uh, heaven is bigger than me, <laughs> and I, I really needed to lean on lean on the Lord and trust in His in His providence. Uh, my life verse is Galatians two twenty. I have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer. I who live, but Christ who lives in me in the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. And so if I see myself as someone who's crucified with Christ and it's no longer I who live, then I'm going to allow Christ to live through me. And I only have so many years that this is the best way to live it, is to let him live through me. That's, audience, I want you to do homework. Here's your homework. What I want you to do is I want you to look up Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 and write it out here. And then here, write Galatians 2.20, and I want you to meditate on how they say the same thing. They do, yeah. The, the Galatians helps you see that it's about Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. In the Old Testament, it's still it's about acknowledging Him, mm -hmm. and He'll guide your life. In all of His ways. That's right. All right, we'll pause, my friend. We'll take a break. I, before we take a break, I just want to remind you that Jeff's story, as well as many others, is on the, the Coming Home Network website, chnetwork.org. And uh, also you can connect to the old Journey Home programs from that as well as at EWTN. So we'll come back in just a moment with more of our discussion with Jeff Gates. Welcome back to the Journey Home. I'm your host, Marcus Grodi, and our guest is Jeff Cavins. And I will mention BibleStudyForCatholics.com. That's Jeff's website, BibleStudyForCatholics.com or AscensionPress.com if you want to find out more about what Jeff is doing and about his books. But particularly, I want to segue into this because you were talking earlier about how God, your bishop said, yeah, you'll be back. Mm -hmm. you know, it's like a, a, a boomerang. But you're going to bring back stuff with you. Right. Yeah, Bishop Driscoll on that day at that convent said three things. He said, the journey that you are on is of God. In other words, what you're going through right now, he said, I sense God is working with you. Uh, you um, you're struggling and you're leaving, but you're going to be back, I believe. Mm -hmm. And you, when you come back, you're going to teach your people. So that's exactly what happened. I did, I did leave. Uh, but I also left with some things that I had learned over the years, some things that I had picked up, some habits that were good uh, from my Protestant days. And, and, and real quickly, my, my intense love for Scripture uh, never went away. My love for witnessing and talking to strangers or anybody about Jesus Christ and His plan for their life, that's something that I really cultivated as a, as a Protestant. My, my love for praise and worship, and, and in fellowship with others. 
all four of those things were, were things that I, my whole life revolved around them. Now, when I came back to the Catholic Church, I did not find those things readily. I did not run into people that carry their Bible everywhere with them. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't run into people who love to sit and just praise and worship God and, and opened up their home for fellowship, you know, around the Word of God. Um, and and, and the, that was a bit problematic to me um, because I was looking for that. And I, I actually went through about a five-year period where I dropped it. I mean, I read, yeah. but I read to study. You know, I read the catechism, church fathers and so forth. But I, I kind of dropped my devotional reading of Scripture for my own heart. Mm -hmm. And I, I studied it for information on, you know, how to give a presentation or something like that. And and my, my fellowship, I, I, I didn't have anybody that I fellowship with the way I did before. Mm -hmm. And so there was a bit of an empty period there. And then a, a number of years ago, I had kind of an awakening. And that was, you know what? Why did I leave this stuff behind? I've gained so much as a Catholic now. Don't get me wrong. My faith is full and it's, it's fruitful and it's wonderful. But it's kind of like what, what John wrote in the book of Revelation to the church in Ephesus. He said, he said, you know, based in Ephesus, they were known for, they knew all the answers. You couldn't trip them up. In fact, Ephesians is the only epistle where Paul doesn't do correcting. These guys had the apologetics down. But he said to them in Revelation, he says, I got one thing, one problem. You lost your first love. Yeah. You're good at all this, but you lost your first love. And I think, well, what do you mean? Well, it's like Emily and, and, and I, when we got married, uh, when we first met each other, we were going out all the time and talking on the phone. And when we got married, you kind of stopped doing that. And you got to return to what you did at the beginning, like John says. And so I thought, you know what? To be Catholic doesn't mean that I have given up this personal relationship with Jesus in Scripture, with Lexio Divina and reading and soaking myself in His Word. And it doesn't mean that I stop telling people about the Lord just because I don't know how to get them into this big church, the Catholic Church. And it doesn't mean that I stop opening up my home to share with other people. And it doesn't mean that I, I stop doing mission trips or pilgrimages and things like that. So over the last, I would say, 10 years or so, Marcus, I have, I have gone back and gathered some of the beautiful truths and nuggets from my past life, and I'm just all the better off now, and I love it. There's a commercial on television where, that sells these fancy sunglasses, uh, high-tech sunglasses that uh, if you've got a big glare in front of you, you just can't even see it, and you put these glasses on, everything's clear. Mm-hmm. You know, and they use that. They show one picture where it's, it looks like it's just white, and you put these glasses on, and you see there's an eagle in there. Right. Well, that's the way I feel about our Catholic faith. We saw the Scripture, mm -hmm. but once we get the glasses on of the yeah. church, then this stuff all, we saw some of the things that tied together before, but now, like the whole covenantal history of the church, into the church, the continuity yeah. of it, now it really makes sense. Yeah. Well, just this last week, my wife and I, we... We spend uh, every morning, this is how it is every morning, I get up, I go downstairs, I make tea for Emily. We sit by the back porch with a round table. She has her Bible, I have mine, and we spend an hour every morning in fellowship and reading scripture, Lexio Divina, and praying for our family. Every morning, an hour. And it was just last week that we were, we were praying and, and I said to her, I looked out the window, I said, you know, honey, uh, we have always been people of the Word of God. You know, we've always been people who study in the Scripture. But as a Catholic, this is so rich. Yeah. This is so rich. So we're enjoying that, but we're enjoying it in the context of the Catholic Church, which is even better. You don't have to be just Bible or just sacraments and church. Bring all of it together as a wonderful, wonderful experience. And that's what we're experiencing as a married couple. Yeah, sometimes I think... Uh, especially Catholic apologists um, who want to point out the flaws of sola scriptura sure. can give the impression that we Catholics are against the Bible, which is not the case no. at all. But we're pointing out the dangers of the Bible alone because there are lots of different ways to interpret Scripture. Yeah. Right. I mean, and as you said, you were into health, wealth, gospel for a while. Mm -hmm. And there are some verses like, by his stripes you are healed, yeah. that can be taken to mean 
ask whatever you want. He's going to give it to you, pressed over, overflowing, and pretty soon it's all about me. It's all about me. Yeah. Yeah. And I would say that's one of the biggest changes of coming into the church is that it's not all about me. <laughs> and you, all you have to do is stand in the middle of St. Peter's in Rome and realize it ain't all about me. <laughs> There's people from everywhere. Yeah. It's, a big, it's, a, it's a big family, the, the church. And as I mentioned earlier in the program, so I do get emails from folk when they wonder, well, what's that Bible you have on your desk, you know, or, or something in here? And I do have a different Bible on my desk. And what I have here is the, a new, newly printed uh, study Bible uh, put out by Ascension Press. And this would be the, the Great Adventure mm -hmm. Bible. Mm -hmm. So, um, again, coming off of the idea that the, the Holy Scriptures, the inspired Word of God, uh, the problem is that alone it can be misinterpreted. Mm -hmm. Why is, for example, the Great Adventure Bible uh, a way of guarding against that, if you will, to make sure that you see the big picture? Yeah. So you interpret things within context. Right. Well, I was very fortunate. Uh, really, the credit goes to the people I work with. You know, I work with Ascension Press, but I work with uh, Dr. Peter Williamson at Sacred Heart. I work with Dr. Mary Healy. Pontifical Biblical yeah. Commission, Dr. Andrew Swafford at Benedictine and Atchison, and Bishop Burns. And so with the Great Adventure Bible, it's like any other Bible, but we show you in there how to read it as a narrative, the entire story. And people like Dr. Peterson, uh, Williamson rather, um, has a great article on how to interpret Scripture as a, as a Catholic. So you can enjoy the Bible, but we try to help people understand how to interpret it, how to read it, uh, to get the maximum out of it. Because there's really two things you really want to get to know. And, and the Catechism says in paragraph 236, you want to know the theology and the economy of God. And when you talk about the theology of God, it goes deeper and says to know the mystery of the Trinity. Now, putting that in lay language, it's knowing the heart of your Father. It's knowing the heart of God. And the second thing is the economy of God, which is the oikonomia, or it is the, the household plan. It's our Father's plan for our lives. And then once you know His heart and His plan, you have the makings of a foundation on which to trust and to live your life. And without that, uh, this becomes sort of a book of nice sayings that you can pull stuff out of once in a while, <laughs> rather than His plan for our lives, where He reveals Himself and He reveals uh, who we are. Uh, to ourselves. So, yeah, I'm, this has been my life since I was 18 years old and yeah. loving it. Yeah, it's like you said, it could be a book of sayings. I have a life verse, you have a life verse. There are lots of verses that people could pull out and this is their life verse that they could take and run with in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. And so making sure it's, well, the verse, and as you know, the verse in Scripture that opened my heart to the church was 1 Corinthians 3.15, uh, 1 Timothy 3.15, that the pillar and bulwark of truth is the church. Right. I always thought it was this, yeah. but it's the church. Right. It's, it's the church. Uh, this Bible is what we, we, we read in the context of the church, the family. We celebrate it in the context of, of the church. We live it out within the context of the church, and we interpret it within the context of the church. It's like the Constitution of the United States. It's, it's not thrown out there, and the president says, what do you all think? Uh, no, we we have a way of interpreting this for the good of all, and that's what the church offers us with the magisterium. That's the bishops in union with the Holy Father, and uh, it gives us a family in which all things Bible can be understood. That, that's the beauty of it. Can I throw a theory out at you, my friend, about Scripture and about the church? Um, we recognize that the Bible alone can bring people to the church or it can lead them off into uh, very anti-Catholic areas. Mm -hmm. But I believe that back in the fourth century, that one of the reasons that the Holy Spirit inspired those bishops and those councils to finalize what this canon is, what New Testament books are going to be read in liturgy, what ones are to be accepted, that one of the reasons was that God in His wisdom knew that there would be people throughout these centuries that usually because of things we did, would become alienated from the church, mm -hmm. who would never ever listen to anything any pope, bishop, cardinal, or Catholic would ever say, especially a, a Catholic TV talk show host, <laughs> and they would not listen. But God loves them. Yeah. 
And God wanted to make sure that his witness would always be there, no matter where in the world, even if we Catholics couldn't get there. Mm -hmm. And that's why he inspired this book. Yeah. So this book would be there. I totally agree with you. You know, those two councils, Hippo and Carthage, they have provided for us now with a sense of certitude that this is our Father's Word. It's like uh, those, those councils are similar to you sitting down with your children or me sitting down with my children saying, look, I know there's a lot being said in the world today, but I want you to know what what I'm saying and that I'm different than what you're going to hear out there. But dad, they're saying some cool things. Cool. Yes. Truth. No. You know, I, I want you to know, and I want you to build your life on this. And, and I think those, those councils back there uh, have been a real uh, grace for us today. And those decisions that were made have really have, gr have great ramifications on our lives yeah. today. Well, you and I both, our life was, brought back to Christ in a deep way outside the church through the scriptures. Yeah. But the difference is that it isn't so that they would stay there. As John Paul says, it's a trajectory towards unity. So the Lord uses this book outside the church, uh, saving thousands of people and bringing their heart to Jesus Christ, turning them from sin. Right. But now we need to build on that to help them see the fullness, which is again why you're doing this and making it available. Yeah, this is my life is uh, Bible studies. And again, EWTN, I owe a lot to EWTN because it was the first series that Scott Hahn and I did, Our Father's Plan, that kind of catapulted the great adventure to where it is today. And without Mother and without EWTN, I don't know that it would, it would have done that. You've written a couple other books, and mm -hmm. we mentioned a little bit about, about suffering. Um, what about the idea of discerning God's will, God's purpose, God's plan in your life? How do we help people sure. who are struggling, uh, especially when the decision they've got to make seems to, it, you know, if I'm going to follow God here and that's where you're calling me, God, I, it might turn me away from family. It might turn me away from friends. It might turn me away from the only way I know to support myself. How do I know this is what you're calling me to do? Well, you know, I think uh, understanding the, the, the will of God for your, for your life is something that oftentimes starts in a, um, in a vacant space, and that is, oh, Lord, what is your will for my life? And we expect the Lord to begin to speak to us. Well, this is your will. Marry that guy, take that job, buy this, sell that, you know, and so forth. And that isn't typically how discerning his will uh, happens. It happens, uh, it happens from the standpoint of relationship, mm -hmm. not just a Bible and uh, a time of prayer, but relationship. And that relationship is that I'm a disciple. I've been chosen to follow Christ. And the criteria on which we're chosen to be disciples of the Lord is one thing. When the Lord says, Lech acharai, come follow me. Mm -hmm. He makes that decision, and all rabbis did in the first century, based on one thing, one criteria. Do I believe as a rabbi that you have what it takes to become like me? Now, Without Jesus, you, no, I don't have that ability to become like God. But he says, come follow me, knowing you can become like me, but not without me. So it is from the perspective, number one, of you're chosen to become like him. And the foundation of discipleship is imitation. It is to become like him, act like him, speak like him, live like him. Once you are committed to that, then the issue of his will for my life becomes much clearer than just what's the will of God for my life? That's a big, big question. Yeah. But from the standpoint of, I'm a disciple of yours, my goal is to become more like you, he begins to open up to us what his will is for our lives. And I made that commitment years and years ago, and I truly believe that's why I came back to the Catholic Church, is that I simply wanted more than Bible reading and a praise service. I was hungering for more as I followed him, and he he pushed back the curtain and said, here's the rest of it. And it was the Catholic Church. The Bible alone, discerning this uh, issue, of discerning God's will, the, one of the problems is we can say, well, I've got Paul's example. He's going this direction. God takes him in this way. We've got Peter. He's fishing. Oh, then he goes in this direction. Uh, Abraham, he's in, he goes in this. So, oh, that must be how God calls me on life. So, Lord, what do you want me to do? Assuming that's going to be here or here. When, when we've got to make sure we have it in the understanding of the church mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that understand that maybe the direction that God's been wanting you to go is the direction he's kind of been taking you, mm -hmm. that there's a trajectory. Yes. Uh, we don't just forget everything that lies behind and press onward. 
we have to understand how God's been working in our life. Well, at the point of my decision to come back to the Catholic Church, I was a Protestant pastor for 12 years. On the side, I was getting into uh, stocks and bonds and mutual funds. I was learning more about it. (laughs) At the moment that I realized I am leaving my pastorate and becoming Catholic, I was offered by several institutions, would you like to work with us in overseeing mutual funds? We'll get your license and so forth. And I remember standing in the bathroom, looking in the mirror, and out loud, I didn't know Emily was around the corner, and I looked in the mirror and I said, what'll it be? Are you gonna, are you gonna serve Christ in your calling, or are you going to make money? That was what I actually said. And Emily came around the corner and she said, honey, she said, God has had a call on your life since you were young. And since you were 18 years old, your whole life has been scripture. Why would you consider veering from that now? And I said, you're right. And that meant going back to school, losing my job, not sure what I was going to do. But that was the path that God led me. And you know what I found out? And I would just say this to your, to your, your uh, viewers, is that every time I made a tough decision and gave up something, God had something around the corner that, that was amazing. Now, I know that a lot of people would say, well, that didn't happen in my life. But I've noticed that pattern in my life is that the Lord was saying, get out of the boat, walk on water. And as I did that, I, I realized that doors were opening in my, in my life. You know, Jesus said, more than any other phrase, he said, do not be afraid. Yeah. And I think the reason he said that is one of my good friends, Bishop Andrew Cousins in the Twin Cities, he said that Jesus said that for a reason. He said it because he knew that if you're going to follow him, there's going to be opportunities to be afraid. And he said, don't be afraid. You know, be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. I really believe that one of the most important scriptures of the New Testament is when John the Baptist says, he must increase, I must decrease. And and as simple as that is, that's really the first step for many of us to go in the direction is some of us, it's all about us. And so just that little step, he must increase, Mm -hmm. even just one little bit, then that is the direction God wants you to go. Mm -hmm. Whatever the, he must increase. I must decrease, and it just, and now after, um, now that I'm over 60, my, the rest of my life is trying to live out all the things I said I, everybody else should do for the last 60 years, but it's always about, he must increase. That's interesting I that you decrease. would say that uh, about you're over 60. I'm over 62, uh, not 62, <laughs> but I'm over 60, and, and I'm in the same boat, Marcus, and that is, I look back now, and you look at your library. I saw your library, yep. and you, you, you know I've got a library. We, neither of us compared to Scott's library. <laughs> but I, I look at that library now, and I ask myself, how much of that are you doing? And I feel like the Lord is telling me, if you never read another book, you've got enough to work on right now to begin to put this really into practice. So I'm like you. I'm like, what's the latest thing out there? I don't know, but I really feel that the Lord wants me to work on my, my heart. You know, to be a better husband, to be a better father, yeah. and to be holy as a disciple of Jesus. That's, that's becoming the love of my life. And as heaven gets closer, um, so the focus of my study is changing. Yeah, yeah. As heaven gets closer, I wondered, what will my kids put on my tombstone? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Was he a good yeah. father? Was he a caring father? Was he a self-centered guy, you know. I mean, that's really what we need. That's a, He must increase. I know. That's, I and that's where, that's where we're at. We, we're at a place where we struggle at times, but we also have the advantage and the disadvantage of uh, looking back on a life and saying, yeah. I could have done this and I should have done that, or I'm glad I did this, and you know, those types of things. There was one more question I wanted yeah. to ask you to talk about. You were brought up Catholic, and you left the Catholic Church, and mm-hmm. you became evangelical on fire, then you came back into the church. One thing I've noticed and appreciated more and more that what is truly unique about the Catholic Church compared to everything else we were at is called the sacramental economy, Mm -hmm. the importance of that. I mean, it's there in the Orthodox too, but but nowhere else is the centrality of the importance of the sacramental economy. Talk about that in your life. You come really to appreciate the importance of the sacramental aspect of the faith. Absolutely. Uh, you know, as a Catholic, uh, our life orbits, are, you know, around the sacraments, and and at the center of that is the Eucharist, the greatest source of grace and the greatest source of of life. And the, what 
what the sacraments do is it, it grounds us in a life, a life. You know, I, I've always said that if you're going to be a disciple of the Lord, uh, it, it should affect the, the shape of your day. Mm -hmm. And the shape of your day reflects the love of your life. If you're married, your day is shaped that way. If you have children, your day is shaped. If you're Catholic, your day is shaped. Your week is shaped. Your month is shaped. Your year is shaped uh, by the church to bring you closer to Christ. You have the liturgical year and mass. You have Eucharist, marriage. Uh, the sacramental economy is simply put, simply put, it is the plan that God utilizes to embrace us and to keep us centered in this, in this kingdom uh, of His. And outside of that, you got the Bible, you got meetings and things like that, but it is the sacraments that ground us. And if our life is focused on the sacramental encounter with Jesus, you stand a much better chance of getting to become like Him and becoming that disciple. And even with the liturgical year, you are forced to, to deal with scripture that, that maybe you wouldn't go to normally. You'd go to your favorites. But in the, in the sacramental economy of the church, um, it, it is all pointed to you becoming like Christ and, and centered on Christ. I love it. I love, I love yeah. it, but for some people it's very mundane. Well, and as you point out in your introduction to the, the, the Great Adventure Bible, you talk about how the, the four parts of the catechism you know, fit with the right. big economy of salvation. And for any of you that don't realize out there how significant the sacramental economy is to the church, you begin reading section two of the catechism and you recognize that is the reason to become Catholic. Yeah. Because the, the, the sacraments are, are really necessary for the graces of salvation. Yeah. And outside the church, a person can proclaim Christ from pulpits in big football stadiums about the need to surrender to Jesus Christ. But sadly, there's sometimes a subtle implication in those proclamations that the church isn't needed, that sacraments aren't needed, that the Eucharist isn't needed. All you need is Jesus. Right. But the church has wisdom. And if you take, for example, the Bible, you got the Bible here, and you talk about the sacramental economy, the four pillars of the, of the, of the catechism. Number one is the creed. That is the story in yeah. miniature. We're Bible-centered. We as Catholics are Bible-centered. This right. is it. And the creed is number one. It is the story in miniature, the creed. Number two, sacraments and liturgy, it's how you get into this amazing story. How do you get into it? How do you become a part of this amazing story? And number three, uh, the moral law, the life in Christ, what is that? That's the script you live. You're living the life of Christ within this amazing story. And then the fourth prayer is what really holds all of this together. And so this sacramental economy centers around this, and it really makes the most out of it. And that's what I appreciate so much about the Catholic Church. Let's try and get in one email. We've got just a minute or so. Brenda from Alabama writes, I have several friends who are converts to the Catholic Church and go to my parish. They have all mentioned to me that they miss the Bible study and prominence, and prominence learning the Word of God had in their previous Protestant churches. They are on fire for the faith, but feel that they aren't really being fed with the opportunity to study Scripture. I realize we hear lots of Scripture at Mass, but it doesn't seem that Catholic parishes are that good about fascinating, dynamic Bible studies. Does Jeff have any ideas why this is and how we can better encourage Catholics to study the Bible? Sure. Well, one of the reasons for that is that we as Catholics oftentimes have the mentality that Father does it all. Father's responsible for it all. Father organizes it all. Father does it all. And that's, and that's just simply not true. When we are young in the Lord, we look to others to feed us. As you grow older and mature, you become the one that puts on the Bible study. You organize. And what I would say to our, our writer, uh, the question, is that it may be time for you to organize a Bible study because there's a lot of good Bible studies out there, as you know. And, and, and that's not the problem is finding a good Bible study. What the problem is is good people starting them mm -hmm. in their parish. And Father's busy. And a lot of times the priest will say, well, I don't want to add one more thing. You add it then and get permission, ask him, and start a Bible study uh, that will be a blessing to, to other people. And, and uh, when we say we're not being fed, oftentimes we mean that the Sunday Mass wasn't exciting like it was maybe in an independent church. The Mass is totally different than a service, but you can create opportunities in your church to do Bible studies 
but you might be the leader now. And there's a transition there of going from, I've always been a follower with mentors to people are looking at me now and I need to step up to the plate. And I remember taking that step and feeling awkward at first, but uh, you'll grow into it and the opportunity will, will open up for you. Good to see you. It's again, so good to friend. see you too, Marcus. It, yeah. The true brother. <laughs> yeah, well, it's good to have you on the program. Thank you for thank you for your witness. Thank you for what you're doing and your teaching. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the gift of the great adventure. And uh, we do pray that God continues to use you thank in so you. many ways. Thank you. Likewise. And thank you for joining us on this episode of the Journey Home. Again, if you want to find out more about what Jeff's going, go to ascensionpress.com. And if you want to find out more conversion stories, go to chnetwork.org. God bless you. See you again next week.